Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Gilad Silverberg and I'm a researcher here at the Department of Neuroscience. Uh, today I will give you just a glimpse of, of uh, what we are doing in our lab. We are interested in, uh, like the original title was, the neural orchestras in the brain. So how different neurons in different brain regions talk to each other to help us do what we are doing. Integrate sensory information, produce motor output, uh, and we work on a, on a region called the basal ganglia. And uh, I will not go very much into details of the study, but just give you an overview of what we are doing. And I hope this will be interesting for you. Uh, I will start with a short, very short introduction of myself. I'm originally from Israel. I grew up in this, in the southern part of Israel, in the in the desert. Uh, very different from uh, Sweden, as you can imagine. Uh, as a child, I was very interested in 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 animals, in animal behavior, what makes the animal. Uh, do certain things at certain times, how does, uh, how does the environment shape the behavior, what is innate, what, what the animals are programmed to do and do almost like a, like a, like a robot, what do they learn to do during their lifespan. Uh, it's very, very fascinating animals that we can find in the desert and that was my early interest as a, as already as a child. Uh, later on I studied physics in, in uh, Jerusalem, uh, did my PhD at the Weizmann Institute, it's another uh, research uh, institute in Israel, uh, already focusing on neuroscience. I did it with uh, Henry Markham, who was interested in cortical circuits. Uh, the lab later on moved to Lausanne, to the APFL, and eventually in 2005 I came here for a postdoc, and uh, at 2008 started my own lab at the Department of Neuroscience. Uh, so, so the two topics that, that, that we are interested in, more specifically, is the integration of sensory information and how does that support motor output. So these are fundamental uh, functions of our nervous system and it can be very, very simple uh, interactions, like a, a little puff on the gill of an aplysia will cause the folding of the, of the mantle uh, the reflex arc, aversive response, so you hear something that's terrible, you, 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 uh, you, you, uh, you close, uh, try to block it from your ears. Very simple sensory motor uh, functions, but it can become very complex, uh, like uh, playing music or being a virtuoso in, in uh, sports or other stuff. For example, if we look at Isaac Perlman playing the violin, you can realize that he has to simultaneously do many sensory motor functions on the fly in parallel. So he needs his eyes to read to read the notes. He needs the ear, ears, the, the auditory input to uh, to um, uh, to hear what he's playing, to correct the fingers uh, on the left hand, to to move the the bow with the right arm. So so all of these things are done on the fly, integrating. Uh, sensory information from different modalities, different side, sides of the body, and doing it uh, seamlessly. Uh, so the entire uh, um, nervous system is devoted to this sensory motor integration, uh, and it is done by the cortex, by, by the, the basal ganglia, thalamus, uh, brainstem, spinal cord. So, so there are many, many different levels of our nervous system that are involved in these sensory motor functions. We focus on the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are subcortical. It's a group of subcortical uh, nuclei, uh, and they are mainly known because of, of uh, uh, very devastating diseases like Parkinson's disease, Huntington's, Tourette. They're involved in many, many more. The list is very long. Uh, one thing that is quite common with these diseases is that they have a very strong motor aspect. So the basal ganglia has been traditionally uh, been studied and researched with respect to the motor functions, motor function and dysfunction. But we know that the striatum, which is the input structure of the basal ganglia, receives a lot of sensory input 
uh, and we believe that these things uh, are, are really a, an important function of the basal ganglia, especially when we know that sensory information is needed to, to, to perform uh, proper, proper motor actions and to, to take decisions, which is the fu function of the basal ganglia. We need to integrate sensory information. We also know that in Parkinson's disease, which is a, a classical basal ganglia disorder, uh, you can alleviate the, the freezing for Parkinsonian patients by sensory input, like lines presented on the floor, uh, auditory signals, visual uh, um, uh, virtual reality, or, or, uh, or uh, tactile stimulation. So you can jumpstart, affect the motor uh, function or the motor dysfunction by sensory information. So even at this level of a very typical motor disease, there is a sensory motor interaction. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, simple scheme of the basal ganglia, and you can see it's made out of many different subnuclei. In this case, it's different boxes and arrows. The striatum is the input structure. It receives information from many different other brain region. And, uh, and th this scheme is being evolving all the time because new pathways are being discovered and new connections, synaptic connections between different regions. Uh, in this talk, we will focus only on this particular pathway. So it's the stratum and the input that it receives from the cortex, or in Swedish, the yernbark, the, the external part of the brain that projects, that sends axons and talks to the stratum. We call it the corticostriatal pathway, uh, and uh, and uh, so so there are two two networks: the cortical network and the striatal network, and the pyramidal cells in layer five of the cortex. The cortex is made out of layers. Layer five sends uh, information to the striatum. They are made out of uh, projection neurons. So every neural network has the projection neurons, the neurons that actually integrate information and send it to other brain regions. And they are the interneurons. So they are local circuit neurons that are within the network and they kind of control the activity of these projection neurons. So the projection neurons in the cortex are the pyramidal cells that send the information to the striatum, and the, inf and the striatum sends information to the rest of the basal ganglia with, uh, with, with a projection neurons called medium spiny neurons or MSNs, and there are interneurons that control the activity of these MSNs. Uh, the, the circuitry, if we zoom into the striatum, the circuitry is made out of a diversity of cells. So we have the, uh, a piece of striatum, and we can see that it's made out of many different cells, and, and that's why the the idea of an orchestra comes. So there are many different cells, they are active simultaneously, they have different properties, like different instruments in the orchestra. Uh, and we have, uh, we have the projection neurons that are more homogeneous and they have a very big population, and they send the information out of the striatum. So we have many different uh, types of interneurons, the cholinergic, NGF, PV, we will not get into to what exactly it means, but they are quite a small population, but very diverse. Uh, and in addition to, to all of this uh, intrinsic circuitry, the internal orchestra it also receives information from other brain regions, from the cortex and thalamus, and also from other subcortical inputs. So the stratum is a bit of a hub that receives a lot of information and has to come out with a decision to move or not to move, to, to, to do this movement or that movement. It kind of uh, is perceived as, as, a, as, a, as a hub, and we have two uh, pathways that go out of the stratum. This is the direct pathway, this is the indirect pathway. Uh, we have ways to label the different pathways and study them separately. Uh, the direct pathway will, will promote movement, the indirect pathway will inhibit movement, and imbalances between these two pathways are the, the pathological uh, hallmarks of Parkinson's disease uh, in which the, 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 the direct pathway is reduced, so there's less activity, and the indirect pathway is uh, increased, so, so resulting in the inability to initiate movements or the freezing or rigidity. Uh, so the questions we are interested in in the lab uh, is 
uh, how does the stratum integrate cortical inputs? The motor and the, and the sensory, how do we integrate information from both sides of the body? How do we integrate information from different sensory modalities? For example, tactile and visual, auditory. Uh, and what happens to this circuitry, to this network, to this orchestra, when we have Parkinson's disease, when there is no more dopamine coming to the striatum? So the way we study it uh, is with two main methods. One is in vivo. We study in the intact animal. We record from neurons in the intact animal. We, we present the animal with stimulation and we record the activity of individual neurons when the animal is, is awake or, or uh, anesthetized, uh, but it's within the network and, uh, and receiving sensory stimulation. We can stimulate the whiskers. That's a very common um, sensory system in the mouse, or we can give uh, visual stimulation like flashes. And the top-down approach, where we want to study the actual circuitry and the connections between the neuron, or to study the, the orchestra, the diversity of cells that work together to, to, uh, to, to underlie this function, uh, is in uh, brain slices. We use patch clamp uh, method, and I will so soon show you what it means. It's a way to record from, from the... Uh, from the different identified neurons electrically. We can record the input that they receive, we can record their electrical activity and, uh, and see how they talk to each other. Uh, in addition to the, to the electrical recordings, we combine it with a method of uh, optogenetics. I guess you, some of you heard about it or not, not at all. So, so it's, a, it's a method that had been developed in the last uh, 11 or, or 12 years. Uh, enabling access to, to activate or inhibit specific neuronal populations with, uh, with light. So, so it is a very powerful technique and it is used in many labs now uh, and it is very natural to combine it with the, with the electrical recordings and behavior. Uh, this is uh, one part of our lab. This is just an example. This is where we, we work with the slices. So this is the microscope. We have the slice here and we have the manipulators here that enable us to record and we can visualize the slice on the, on the screen and record the activity of several neurons at the same time. They can be really close neighbors and we study the electrical connections between them to understand who talks to who. Which, which type of neuron talks to, to another type of neuron and how it makes sense that they together integrate the sensory information and produce the motor output. So this is a video made by one of the PhD students in the lab, just a demonstration of how a typical patching of a neuron. So patching is the type of recording we do. This is a, is a uh, electric, uh, as, as a glass pipette, uh, which we will use for, uh, for recording. It's an electrode. What you can see here are different cell bodies, neurons, in the, um, in the mouse uh, striatum. This is a cell type we're interested in. We know it's a cholinergic cell, and we use the, the pipette to attach ourselves to the, to the, um, to the membrane of the uh, of the cell and make a little hole that enables us to record and also fill the cell with dye so we can look at the morphologies later on. So, so this is a typical uh, slice work uh, and what we are interested in is to, to patch from such neurons and see how they receive cortical input, how they integrate it, how they talk to each other. So. We know from previous studies, and this is work that I did during my own PhD, uh, that the same presynaptic cell, cell that is active, can send very different messages to its neighbors. So there's a lot of information going on. So when I talk, I assume that you, you, you hear more or less the same. But in fact, it's not completely true, and it's specifically not true in neural networks. So the same cell, the presynaptic cell, can be active with, with, a, with a certain uh, uh, train of action potentials, but two different cell types will listen to a very different tune, very different information, uh, and that is done by the element that connects the two cells, the synapse. In this case, it's a depressing synapse. In this case, it's a facilitating synapse. So even if this presynaptic cell fired ta 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 this response, the electrical response in one cell will be very different from the electrical response in the other.
So there is a diversity in the way that, that uh, the target cells hear the message, the activity from one cell. And this is part of the, of the, the, the fascinating things about this neural orchestra. Now, <laughs> it's says no, uh, interneurons that express somatostatin. Uh, so we were interested to know if these kind of principles also occur in the pathway that we are interested in, the, the corticostriatal pathway. So the way to do it was to, to inject this channel rhodopsin, which is, a, which is a, um, the protein that enables this light response. So we can activate these cells just by shining light and record from cells in the striatum to see how they respond to the activity of these, uh, of these uh, stimulated cells. So we have the, the light shining on the slice and we have our pipettes recording simultaneously from different cell types. Then we can shine the light, activate different activity patterns of the presynaptic cells the, to activate them to talk and we can listen to what the, what the striatal cells of the different types hear. And uh, the summary of, of, uh, of this study that is, uh, that is now ongoing in the lab is that there are very, uh, very big differences between the, the, between the cells. So we can see here different cell types. So these are neurons that we record. We can inject with the pipette current steps and we can see how they fire spikes. This is when they are talking and they are very different from each other. And uh, there are different cell types, they have different electrical properties, they talk differently, but they also hear differently. So when we activate the same, uh, the same presynaptic cells, they are supposed to listen to the same message. You see the message is very different. So these cells, the uh, chat cells, for example, here in purple, they can hardly hear input from the somatosensory cortex, from the cortex that is responsible uh, to integrate in the mouse the, the whisker responses. They can hardly feel it. Fast spiking cells, a different type of internon, has very strong responses. Uh, and we could see here that there is a very high diversity, very large differences between the message that is received from the cortex to the different cell types in the striatum. So there is a diversity that, that, that assigns specific roles to each uh, type of neuron, to each instrument in the orchestra. Not only that, the same uh, cluster of different cell types also receive input from different regions, from S1, the somatosensory cortex, from motor cortex, and from the thalamus, it's another brain region. And also, depending on the presynaptic region, you also get different messages. So there's a, a multitude of, of combinations and of information that can be encoded in such a complex network. So you have different cell types, they receive input from different brain regions. So you have tons of combinations uh, that will be activated at certain, uh, at certain brain states and certain occurrences, certain sensory information, sensory integration. So the conclusion from the study is that we have a diversity in the inputs that different cell types receive, stronger inputs to certain cells, the fast spiking and the projection neurons, weaker to uh, cholinergic and somatostatin expressing cells, and there are differences between the different brain regions that talk to the stratum. The next question, and this involves uh, in vivo studies, is how do, do, does this pathway contribute to sensory integration? So when we actually uh, stimulate the whisker of a mouse, how will it be encoded in the stratum? How is the stratum involved in this uh, sensory integration? Uh, and to do this, we work uh, in vivo. So we have the intact animal. In this case, it's a mouse, anesthetized. We'll make a tiny hole in the skull and, uh, and record from, uh, from neurons. So first, we needed to know where to record, where to find the neurons that will respond to, to whisker stimulation. So we found the, the uh, we injected some dye in the, in the cortex that processes sensory information. And we saw that they project here to the, to the dorsolateral stratum. Then we recorded from cells in the dorsolateral stratum and we can see their typical activity 
So we know we are recording from, from a single cell and we can see the typical slow waves that are associated with uh, sleep. And, and this is, uh, and uh, if we inject a bit of positive current to the cell, we can also see the cell firing. So, so we know that we are in the right place. Uh, this is the spontaneous activity when the mouse is sleeping. This, this is what the cells do. So the cells are alive and kicking uh, and we could even uh, fill the cells with some dye and later on find the cell and see the morphology. You can see here the cell body and these are the dendrites of the cell, the, 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 the tree that receives all the inputs, the, the receiving antenna of the cell. Then we, we recorded the responses to sensory stimulation. So we, we gave brief air puffs to the uh, left or the right or to both whiskers of the mouse and we saw these responses. Okay, so, so the, the cells in the stratum responded to the air puffs. And there was a difference in how they responded to left or right. So if we had neurons in this case uh, that we recorded was in the left stratum, uh, we could see that they encoded stronger the right input. So there is this crossing. The dominant was the contralateral uh, and the smaller responses were to the ipsilateral. So there are smaller responses and they come a bit with a delay. So from the single cell that we record, we can encode whether input comes from the left or the right. Okay, so they responded to both but they responded differently. So, so the cells, the individual cells can encode if the sensory input comes from here or from there. Both in the, the amplitude of the response, the delay of the response. So these are the, the average responses of individual cells to ipsilateral stimulation, contralateral, and this is the red when we stimulate both, both uh, whiskers. We could also see that the input that the cells receive can be or excitatory depolarizing, that means it's positive input that drives the cell, or inhibitory, that inhibits the cell. And usually the cells, when we stimulate the whisker, they receive both. It's a mixture of excitation and inhibition, and we have different ways to, to study it. And we could see that the excitation comes first, and then the inhibition comes later. Uh, and then the, that excitation comes before the inhibition, uh, and is a bit stronger. So at least in these cells, when we activate the, the, the whiskers, we can see differences in this balance between excitation and inhibition, what drives the cell to fire and what will inhibit and push them away from firing. Next, we wanted to see which neurons in the, in the mouse stratum respond to visual stimulation. So before we, we studied only tactile, so, so we deflected the whiskers and saw the responses. We wanted to see how uh, they uh, integrate visual sensory input. So we gave, we shined light into the contralateral eye. We did the same experiments recorded from, from uh, cells in the stratum. Uh, and we found cells that responded not only to visual stimulation, but also to tactile. So individual cells in the stratum integrated you can see here the blue trace of the, the whisker stimulation and the green trace is the visual stimulation. So they integrate multisensory information. So they receive information that the, the whiskers were moved uh, or deflected and that there was light coming, uh, shining into the, the eye of the mouse. So they integrate the visual and the tactile information. The same neurons do that. And these neurons were located more medially in the in the medial part of the stratum so this part of the of the mouse brain is the stratum so dorsal dorsomedial the the cells that you can see here in orange were cells that responded to both visual and tactile input the next question we wanted to answer what happens to all of these responses in an animal model for Parkinson's disease. We know in Parkinson's disease there are many, many effects. There's the rigidity, uh, hypokinesia, tremor, freezing, uh, mainly motor symptoms. But we know that there, is, there are also sensory deficits and we specifically wanted to know what happens to these sensory responses in an animal model for Parkinson's disease. So what happens in Parkinson's disease is that the stratum that, that has these, uh, these uh, uh, MSNs that project to the direct pathway or the indirect pathway. They have these dopamine receptors. They have a very strong recipient of a 
a neurotransmitter, neuromodulator called dopamine. And in, the, in Parkinson's, there is a depletion of dopamine. The cells that make the dopamine and provide it to the stratum are, are, uh, are dying. And then there is less and less dopamine in the stratum. So there is an animal model for, for uh, mimicking uh, some of the effects of Parkinson's disease. Uh, we inject a toxin that kills the dopamine cells. And what you can see here is the stratum of an animal that, uh, that, that was injected with the 6-hydroxy dopamine, this, uh, this uh, toxin, uh, on the left side. So you can see that the staining for uh, TH, which is a precursor for dopamine, making neurons, uh, you can see it's dark here and it's light here. It means that it's a unilateral lesion of dopamine. And then we want to see what happens to the stratum of a dopamine-depleted mouse. So we record in control animals, we record in 6-hydroxydopamine, in dopamine-depleted animals, and we, we, we wanted to see what happens. Uh, for that, we needed to identify the neurons because we expected it to, to have a different effect on the D1 cells, the ones with the dopamine receptor uh, type 1, which are the direct pathway neurons, and the D2 cells, which are the indirect pathway neurons. Uh, and uh, and it was uh, and they are intermingled and since we do these recordings blind we couldn't identify them so we used uh, uh, a nice trick that was developed at the Weizmann Institute by uh, 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 the laboratories of Ilan Lampel and Ofer Ishal and that enables us to to stimulate with light combine the, the electrical recordings and light stimulation with the channel rhodopsin to tell us if the cell expresses chanorhodopsin or not. So we could express chanorhodopsin, this, this, uh, this um, light, um, uh, light sensitive uh, protein, um, only in direct pathway cells or only in indirect pathway cells. And while we record to see if they respond to light. So this is a scheme of the experiment. We have the, the patch pipette like you saw before, but in vivo in the intact animal. We patch from a cell, then we shine some light, and we can see if the cell will fire. So in this case, this is a cell that expresses chanorhodopsin. So we know in this case it was an indirect pathway cell or a direct pathway cell. So when we shine the light, the blue light, you can see that we activate the cell. We activate it. This is another cell that did not express it. So when we shine the light, we couldn't activate the cell. It just continued doing whatever it was doing. So we can do now the recordings and know if we were in this type of cell or that type of cell. And we repeated the experiments. Whisker stimulation from the right, from the left. And what we, we found out is that in the lesioned animal, in the Parkinsonian dopamine depleted animals, there were not so big differences between the whiskers, the whisker stimulus from the right and the left. That means that control normal animals were very good in distinguishing right and left uh, uh, whisker stimulation. You can see here a very big difference in the amplitude of the contralateral versus ipsilateral responses, both in the amplitude, also in the latency, but in the in the dopamine depleted mice, the differences were abolished. So, so the, the single cell was not so good in encoding the information, whether it comes from the right and the left. So that was our, our, uh, the, the first finding regarding the Parkinsonian uh, bilateral uh, deficit. And the next step was to try to use uh, a drug that is used uh, to replace uh, dopamine. It's called levodopa. When you inject it, it kind of replaces uh, dopamine and compensates a bit for the lack of, uh, for the uh, degeneration of the dopaminergic cells. So when we, we inject levodopa, we could restore this bilateral uh, encoding. So this is the, the summary, this is the average of the control mice. You can see differences between the contra and ipsi lateral response, uh, very similar in the lesioned animals, and again, very different in the animals that were Parkinsonians, but were treated with a, with a drug that is a, an anti-Parkinsonian drug. Uh, so to summarize, all the neurons we recorded in the dorsal stratum responded to whisker stimulation, so they integrate uh, tactile sensory information. Uh, they, they receive input that is both excitatory, 
upward going uh, input and inhibitory with the excitation stronger and coming before the inhibition. Uh, a subpopulation, these medial, dorsomedial cells, integrate both puff uh, stimulation of the whiskers and visual input, so multisensory integration. And uh, there were differences in the way that the direct pathway and the indirect pathway integrated the sensory information. And in, the, in dopamine depleted animals, Parkinsonian animals, there was a less, uh, th there was a reduction in the separation of bilateral uh, whisker responses. So the detectability of whether input comes from the left or the right was impaired in the Parkinsonian mice. Now another question that we are trying to answer now is how motor activity depends, uh, uh, shapes sensor integration. So you know when the animal is, is, uh, is immobile, doing nothing or sleeping, we, we can uh, provide sensory information and we get responses. But we know from other studies that in the cortex, when the animal is moving, let's say locomoting or whisking, it affects the sensory information. And the interesting thing is that it affects auditory very differently from the visual. So, so when the animal was walking, it, 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 it suppressed uh, auditory input. So there was a less sensitivity to auditory input, but there was increased sensitivity to sensory input. These were two studies made by different labs in the, in the cortex. And we are interested to know what happens in the stratum, in the basal ganglia. And uh, to do that, uh, what we do is to repeat these experiments, but in the animal, when the animal is uh, walking walking or standing and walking and standing and we compare the sensory responses when the animal is walking. So th this is just an illustration uh, of a recording from a neuron that responds to bilateral whisker stimulation but also encodes the movement. So the red trace here is the speed of walking of the, of the animal and what we can see here that when the animal walks faster, when there's, a, when there's increased speed, there is increased activity of the neuron. So these are spikes. This is when the animal, when the neuron is firing and talking. You can see that when the animal walks uh, or runs faster and faster, there is increased activity. When the animal stops running, there is a decreased activity. So these neurons participate both in the sensory uh, integration of information, information from the whiskers and also in the movement. Yeah, so this is actually all. This was the last, uh, last slide. These are the people in my lab that did these experiments throughout the years. Uh, and, uh, and these are the funding sources. Thank you.